Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. If you love having a laugh and live in Melbourne, then head down to the Rubber Chicken in South Melbourne. It's a dedicated comedy venue. Drink, eat and have fun in the Elliot Gobbler Bar on the ground floor. Or head upstairs to Punchline's Comedy Club, featuring Australia's funniest professional comedians. This is Melbourne's comedy hub and it's also the home of the School of Hard Knock Knocks. So get on down to the Rubber Chicken in South Melbourne. You're listening to the School of Hard Knock Knocks podcast with me, Steve Davis. Ladies and gentlemen, your next comedian. (laughs) Some drink on an empty head, you know that, don't you? Uh, That is the shittiest knuckle I've ever heard in my life. Everyone in this room is now dumb for having listened to it. That's a bucket list. (laughs) You have dangerously underprepared yourself for the shit that is about to get real. Haitian-American comedian Ashley Philome had it all. International tours, sold-out shows, and supporting a mega-comedian for 11 years. But he stepped away for love. In this School of Hard Knock Knocks podcast episode, you'll learn how Ashley had to reinvent himself throughout life. First, growing up with grandparents in Haiti, schooling in Florida, being homeless, being the support act of Pablo Francisco, and then going it alone in Australia. This is not only a podcast about comedy. Host Steve Davis and Ashley Philome drop some serious philosophical bombs, son. Uh, You'll get that reference later. So sit back and enjoy this episode. And if you do, be sure to listen to previous episodes with some of Australia's and the world's funniest comedians. I'm so happy to be here, man, because I've been doing comedy for 22 years. And I've been to 17 countries, and I'll tell you right now, Australia is the most laid-back country I have ever seen in my whole fucking life. You guys aren't too PC in America. My comic friends are scared to perform because people have a protest. Over here, you guys don't give a fuck. <laughs> it's pretty cool. So in saying that, let me go ahead and address the awkwardness, because right now what's happening is what we have is an African-American on a platform in front of a bunch of white folks. <laughs> Long time ago, this would have been a fucking auction. <laughs> and now we welcome to the School of Heart Knock Knocks podcast, Ashley fils Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to, to this because <laughs> you have trotted this globe with your comedy and I want to just you know, pick out some of the gems that have been weathered by that experience. I hope you're okay with that. Absolutely, absolutely. Now... Uh, I want to get the personal stuff dealt with firstly, because I'm told that you came to Australia about seven years ago, 2014, if I'm correct, from the US, right. Right. And, and it's love that kept you here. Is that true? <laughs> yes, it's uh, love. The love, love of one particular person, uh, but also the love of the people as well, but two different types of love. Uh, the particular person uh, I can uh, make love to and the people uh, they're, they're, it's platonic <laughs> <laughs> well the best I can put it. You, you sound like you haven't tested that out though you're just assuming it's platonic nah I don't I, <laughs> I don't think it's something you want to test out unless you want to get arrested or uh, get <laughs> like a creep you can't like test out making love on everybody <laughs> I mean <laughs> well <laughs> that's uh, that's, uh, <laughs> The, 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 the thing is, though, now you said, you know, you could get arrested, but let's face facts here. You do skate close to the wind when it comes to risking being arrested because uh, I, I'm told that you had to write a letter to our government apologising for some of your jokes once. So there's a precedent there. Ashley, can you... Ah, uh, yes, that's true. <laughs> yeah, so wow, you did, you, you did your research. <laughs> and I'm going to throw your past back at you when you try to wheedle out of questions like that too. So tell me... Oh, man, this is a... <laughs> what... Uh, 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 the only person listening to this is our Attorney General, so you know, tread carefully. Ah, uh, great. Why, I love this country. <laughs> why <laughs> did you have to write a letter to our government to apologise? Um, because I originally came here on a tourist visa. This was pre... 
you know, we have to go back just a little bit. I came here in 2014. When I came here in 2014, that's when I started living here. Um, however, before then, I was just visiting here and visiting the person that uh, I'm currently married to and I fell in love with at the time. But being a comedian, a professional comedian, I did a couple of shows um, uh, on a tourist visa. Now, I, even though I, I wasn't getting paid for these shows, it wasn't a bad. It was a bad look on the Department of Immigration when I went to apply for an extension, and they go, "Well, we'll call you back." And then they call me back, and they said, "Listen, it seems like you performed here on a tourist visa, and you were taking jobs away from Australians, so we're going to have to have you have you leave the country." Uh, it was pretty much you, wow. have, you have twenty, yeah, you have twenty days to leave, or we're going to ban you for three years. They were nice enough to give me the twenty days to leave, which I took, and I left the very next day. The very next day, I didn't even take any chances. I uh, just packed myself and I left, thinking and I got a lawyer. And my lawyer goes, "Listen, just you know, just go back and you know, reset your visa, and you can come back in a couple of weeks." And that couple of weeks turned into. Uh, a month and then two months and then we had to get a freedom of, freedom of information uh, uh, paper so we could see what the problem was because they kept denying my visa and that's what the problem was the problem was that they, they were upset that uh, I performed on on a tourist visa and to them that's a form of work because they're, I, was, I was already at a, at a professional level even though there were open mics and whatnot so my lawyer goes listen um, they, they just want you to show that you're sorry for what you did I'm like, okay. So I had to write a letter of apology to the government, kind of like Johnny Depp yes. did to, uh, to um, what, what's his name? The, the guy with the, uh, the, guy with the Yes, the tomato head? man, um, whose name Barnaby is, Joyce? Yes, that's it, Barnaby, Barnaby Joyce? Joyce, yes. You know, he's uh, from New Zealand, right? Hmm. Yeah, he is. That, that Something came out, well, he's actually from New Zealand. There was like a, a story that came out a long time ago about people in Parliament who aren't qualified to be, or some, something like that. But I'm just saying that to say this joke. So now his name is Barnaby <laughs> Joyce. Anyway, so yeah, he had to write a letter, <laughs> write a letter of apology to the, to the government. Uh, I and uh, yeah, so I did that. And have you still got a copy of that letter yourself? Because it would have been some beautiful yeah. Shakespearean writing, I imagine. Uh, yeah, I had to to make certain that I didn't seem like I was taking the piss when I was doing it. Cause you know, it's, it's difficult to <laughs> say sorry for making people laugh, but I was, I was truthful. I was like, I was actually there because I wanted to see, to see about the, the, the woman that I was dating to see if we could make this happen. And I happened to do some shows on the side and she can't come to America because she has to take care of her parents. And then she also wrote a letter as well, backing oh. it up. Oh, yeah. that's so nice. Did that. Yeah, she, we 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 got together and we we put it we put it together and then one day they gave me a call. They're like, "Listen, you can come back, but the first three months you're not to perform until you get your. You can come back as a as a visitor, and then you can apply for um, a partner visa. And when you do that, that's when you can start performing again. And that's what I did. So I came back and I just you know I did a lot of watching, I did a lot of studying, and I just did a lot of studying comedy, not like studying. Like, you know, like studying in school because I couldn't do that. But just like, you know, I just waiting. And then my, when my turn came, I uh, I started performing. And it was a weird, it was a weird, weird time. Yeah, it's weird to be doing it when it's legal, I imagine. Uh, <laughs> Illegal to make people laugh. That's what it was. Yes. Now, actually, you know what? You, you know, I, I've, just got, go I've just got one geopolitical observation to make because... To think that our government said you were taking jobs away from Australians when you earned zero uh, actually winded me a bit because it's normally America we make fun of because the minimum wage over there is so terribly low. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's, that's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 it, that's the thing. Uh, you know, I think the minimum wage there is like, a, well, before back then it was like, like when I was a waiter, I was getting paid two thirteen an hour. Wow! Uh, for what? But we we survive off tips. Any job that had tips, you'd get at least two two dollars an hour. The maximum you would get is five dollars. I was a valet driver, and we were getting paid five an hour. So we lived, we lived off tips over here. Tipping's not a thing, so I was I would imagine that probably com compensates uh, for. I'm curious. You know, not, not do you think that the need to get tips? Also, um, is something that people who've got a comedic streak have a greater chance of uh, achieving because you know about reading a crowd and trying to get, in this case, their tip, but it's similar to getting a laugh. Absolutely. Oh, 
of course, because communication and likability, all the, all the factors that involve um, performing is the same factors you would include and um you know, getting a tip from being a waiter. But not only that, if you think about it, in, in any industry where you want to uh, persuade or, you know, convey your message, humor is always the best uh, uh, tactic. That, that that puts the barriers down. That puts you, that makes the other person vulnerable if they were, you know, if they had their guards up. You know, it's, it's, I think humor is the most important thing for anything. I can't think of a situation mm. where if you want to, um, gain access to something through someone where you would where human wouldn't work you know even if, if even if it's the toughest of like toughest of uh, clients or bosses humor breaks you down it did nothing i don't think anything works it's not music because you can't sing a song to somebody when you're trying to woo a client you know or when, when you're giving a powerpoint presentation you, you can sing but it's not, it's not going to do anything um but one one joke that's it you're in yeah that, you- that's it that's relationships anything That'd be interesting to see if there's any debt collectors listening who might want to take you up on that and just give it a try. No, I've, I've had debt collectors to, uh, who I, I've actually tried to take a piss out of, and they just they joined right on in. I mean, they didn't get the money, but we definitely had a good time performing it to, to each other over the phone, <laughs> trying to convince each other. <laughs> there you go. So now, I, I want to just cycle back a, a little bit to um, hopping off the, the ride of the world to sort of pause here in Australia, because I believe you're on tour for about 11 years with Pablo Francisco, and you're flying right. all around the world. Which right. I imagine was happening at quite a pace, and then right. you've sort of hung up those wings to a great degree. Yep. What was that transition yep. like, and and what are some of the memories back in those pre-COVID days of of jet setting? Oh man, it was a very, it was a it was a cycle. Uh, we perform uh, five days a week with uh, with Sunday and Monday, and sometimes and some Tuesdays off. So four to five days a week uh, we perform, and what we would leave on a on a Wednesday or a Tuesday, perform at a comedy club until Sunday, come back that Monday and leave again on a Wednesday. We did this for about 11 years. And sometimes, you know, because America has so many comedy clubs at weekly rooms, you know, so there's a plenty to do. And he was high, he still is in high demand. So we were, sometimes we would fly out. I remember one time or twice, we flew out to Norway to do one show oh. and came back like the next day. It was one of those things where it was like, oh, here we go. You know, and um, it was a very, very um, tremendous amount of time consumption that uh, I learned a lot, but I also come to find out you know, in hindsight, I missed a lot as well. Oh, what do you uh, mean? I missed I'm, I'm, I, this is where I, I, I really come to understand. Like when I was touring with Pablo, and mind you, I went from like being homeless to actually being on tour with him. So it, it, my my dynamic changed really fast by the time I was 21, and I started when I was 18. And when I started touring with him, I, that was it. You know, in my mind, <clears throat> because I'm young, I'm still an understanding this business. All I know is that I have work every week i don't have to worry about where, where work comes from you know i'm i'm getting and i'm staying in the same hotels as he is i'm getting the same treatment to a certain degree like he is as far as like the flying and you know the limo rides and all that type of stuff and you know that that was ingrained in me when i was like 21 hmm. and uh or 22 at the time and so for this happened for you know a, a bit over 11 years so here's what i, I I learned a great deal about performing in front of international audiences, and I learned about how, you know, the business works from, you know, as far as, like, the pampering side, but I never really had to worry about administrative duties, you know? So I've never done a comedy festival. I never even knew how to put, what to what to, to put together to do a comedy festival, because when I did comedy festivals, I was doing it as, as its opening act. So I was always in the festival, but I never had to, you know, get, people to come to my show or those type of things that you have to learn when you, when you first begin, I skipped out on all that. So when I left the tour, I had to start all over again. What really happened for me fast was my ability to perform stayed on par because I had the experience. But when it came to me starting to do my own shows, you know, that's when I started like becoming weary because I had to, you know, mind you, Pablo sold out at least 95% of his shows. I've always performed to sold out audiences, whether it was six thousand in the audience or whether it was four hundred in the audience. You know, he was making a minimum of, a minimum of fifty k a week. Jeez. I would imagine it's more now. You know, so I was surrounded by, I was living vicariously through him, not realizing this was in my life. And when I did realize it was, it was this was in my life, it was time for me to separate because I realized I had to grow my own wings. But I didn't realize that what what I, education that I missed out on was learning how to 
do your own administrative work and be your own agent and be your own manager and be, you know, all these things that I missed out on. So you, I'm learning that. I'm currently teaching that, teach that to myself right now. Okay. So you, do you feel like you've mastered that now or you're still in a little bit of a, a learning curve? Because you've, you've, you've been your own master for quite a while now. Yeah, well, look, uh, the performance, is, it's called show business, you know? Uh, I'll be the first one to say, I, got, I never have anything to try to prove to anybody by saying this. is like, the show part, I'm, I'm, I conquer that. I'm, I'm very happy with that. The business part is a part that I've actually had to re, relearn, and I'm still learning about, to tell the truth, okay. uh, because there's so many different aspects involved that I wasn't aware of, because those things were always taken care of for me. It's like a spoiled child being set out to live on his own, and he has to realize, oh, shit, I got to get a job. Yeah. Can I curse? That, that, that is curse? I said, shit. Oh, 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 snap. I have to get a job. Or, um, oh, 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 my gosh, I have to, you know, I have to do it's, it's the same equivalent. So that's what I'm learning, because I was used to being pampered my whole career, like literally pampered. Because I, I was only unprofessional. It took me like two two or three years before I got discovered by Pablo, and he just took me on board, you know? I, I, I live with, I, we live together as well, you know? We, it's a big house. It's got a jacuzzi in the living room. That's how, the, how big the house is. <laughs> in the living room is a jacuzzi. So it was like, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a different world. Yeah. When I came here, though, um, I got to reinvent myself. And I would advise this to anybody who um, wants to reinvent themselves or is going through a rough patch. Is just get away from where you are, where nobody knows you, because now you can just be yourself and people will accept you for what you put out. And you can create your own person and you can actually learn uh, things that you haven't uh, been able to learn before because of, of the distractions. So get out and, uh, you know, be a prophet in a different town. You can't be a prophet in your own town. Well, that's true. And I, I like the um, the irony almost of that awakening that you had because yeah, and that analogy of the, let's say, the uh, the prince the, the royal prince who's grown up, everything delivered, and now has to sort of make their own way. That is an age-old comedy trope. Comedies really? are built around that, and here you are a comedian, and you've lived that. Uh, is, is that something you can milk for your comedy work, or is that too in? Meaning, uh, like... Ma- making fun uh, of your adjustment uh, and... Re- uh, you know what, actually, I, I actually never really thought about that. Um, that's definitely there for, you know, material and, you know, uh, you know, I don't want to call them jokes, but, you know, bit, material. Let's yeah. leave it a material. Yeah. I feel like saying jokes just cheapens the whole the whole actual of what we do, even though we do tell jokes per se, but what we do is far more than tell jokes. If you really think about it, we're just because we're showing different perspectives of how we think, you know, and we all think differently. And I always figured, you know, one thing I always think of too is like people want people to think like them. I, I don't really think you want that. If you really want people to think like you, then the whole, everything is, there's no point of entertainment. Like if I was on stage and everybody thought like me, everybody would know where my joke is going. Everybody would know what I'm thinking next. And there would be no airplanes because they have a fear of flying. So if everybody has a fear of flying, we, we wouldn't get anywhere. Mm. So you want people to think differently and differently to you. And that's what comics do. We all think differently, but comics, we offer, we're uh, brave enough or egotistical enough, <laughs> egotistical yeah. enough to offer our, offer our, our um, per- perceptive or perce- perspective on things. Yeah, to stand up front and, and tell a story, hopefully a story with a surprise that triggers us to laugh. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It triggers you to laugh, triggers you to, um, to think. I don't really care about making the audience think that much. Uh, I'd rather them laugh and then think later. Okay. You know, so I'm at that, my, my goal is not to make you think. My goal is to make you laugh through a different avenue a different way of thinking. Like, I don't want you to know how where we're going with this joke. I'd rather you just listen to it, and then or before you know the joke hits you. So you think about it later, but you're laughing now, you know? Yeah. Well, I hope you're happy where we're going in this interview, because I've got one more thing that I want to get off before we get into mainstreaming thinking about comedy, and that's your right. um, Haitian roots, because you, you've lived a lot yeah. of your life in, in the U.S., but uh, Haiti is... Oh, yeah. <laughs> You've done your research, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, because I'm really fascinated because it, all countries, they have a cluster of nearby countries where they're in our general focus. So, you know, obviously New Zealand things we pick up on, you know, Singapore here. But Haiti is not one of those countries for the Australian 
psyche. And so when we just had it um, come onto our news screens, typically when there's something bad, like bad storms right. and flooding or earthquakes, right. or just recently the assassination of, of yes. a president, is there a guttural reaction? How much do you identify with what's happening in Haiti? Or is that a different world? That's part of the, the old Ashley, and it's a, a distant, dim connection. Mm, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, actually, I look uh, a death of any kind. People always are always con find the connection to it some way. If you find somebody that dies, if you have a friend that has a friend of a friend that dies, somehow you you're connected to it, right? So in this case, with the pre the president being uh, assassinated, uh, it it. It resonated with me because number one, it's a death. And then when I saw it on the news, and when I heard the my native language being spoken, mm. it really hit me harder because I guess hearing that just affected me differently, you know. Because and I'm, I'm watching this on um, Australian television. Yes, you know, you know how like when they 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 interview somebody who speaks a different language other than English, and right in a couple of in the beginning, a couple of seconds, the person answers, and you can hear their native language, and then you hear the translator come on. Correct. Yep. Yep. That little bit, that little couple of seconds, really, that's when it really hit me. Just hearing that a little bit, I'm like, oh my gosh, because I haven't heard that in forever. You know, there's, there's hardly any Haitians here, I don't think. So, it, um, me being Haitian, um, kids how it happened. I'm Haitian, right? I'm Haitian American, but I was born in Brooklyn and I was raised in Haiti. So, whenever my mother got pregnant with a child, she'd fly to, from Haiti to New York because we had family there and she'd have the child on American soil. That way, the child would be considered American. Wow. Back then, it was a right. So back then, it was it was legal, so to speak. So if your child was American, then eventually you you be, you, you you have no problem coming in America. So mind you, she did this five times. So I'm there because of five kids. So every time she had a uh, right right before she had the baby, like you know, she'd fly, fly from Haiti to New York, have the baby there, and then fly back to America, oh, and fly back to Haiti, and save up enough money. And then when she had enough money, she flew back to America with the whole family. Um, left me behind with my grandparents, too, but other four kids. Um, you know, and that's how we, she, we started living in America. So my association with New York is just being born there, literally. I was just born there, and then when I was of uh, age, at that young age, I was, like, able to fly back to Haiti and be raised with my grandmother. And that's where I learned Creole, French, and I picked up a bit of Spanish, right? Because I speak four languages. Um, one of them... One of them is kind of weak, but I, I can get by. And that's a Spanish one. That's because my grandmother is Dominican. And uh, when I was six, I came to uh, Miami, Florida, and I had to learn English. And that they put me back. They helped me back two years. Uh, the educational system is different from America than it is over here. In America, you just go from like grade one to two, and you do like a year. You don't go back and forth like you guys have like breaks in between. We yeah, just do yeah. like six, seven months. So when I was in the second grade. They and I was supposed to go to the third grade. They actually held me back in the third grade, and then I did, I repeated the third grade, and they took me from the third grade and put me back to the second grade. So, if, so also I was like the oldest kid in school and in, in my classroom for the rest of like the rest of my my school life because my English was so bad. I couldn't you know speak English. I couldn't get a grasp on it because I was still trying to figure out what was going on. French and Creole were, were my main languages. Then out of nowhere, I just became like this English like master of English and I was like in and doing like I was in the high academics and this was like elementary school and in junior high I became you know a little bit of a misbehaving kid so I, I, I don't know but I resonate with being uh, being Haitian um, it's just hard for me to um, connect because yeah. there's no uh, nothing that connects me to it and language is so important let alone being immersed in the culture I, I I lived in Hungary and worked there for a couple of years and struggled to learn their language and thank God all the locals wanted to practice their English so I got by but I feel that I was robbed of something that you've got and from my conversations with my Hungarian friends who are all multilingual, not just bilingual, yeah. amazing race of people. Um, um, when you're talking in a different language, you're thinking in a different way. Do, is, yeah. is that true to you? And do you think... Absolutely. Does that help you with, with writing your material? Um, not helping write my material, but it, help, it helps with problem solving. There's a thing where if you have a problem in, in your life and you're trying to figure it out, the best way to figure it out in your mind is to speak your native language. So mm. if you're, um, 
if you're from if you're from a Latin country and you speak and you're, and you're living in an English country and you speak English and you're trying to problem solve in your head, you know whether it's something personal, you know how you think to yourself. The best way to get the truth is to speak your native tongue. So whenever I have like a situ- situation that I have, that I'm going through that I really got to think of, I I start I speak Creole in my mind. And if for some reason, it just resonates. Like you, I feel like my parents are talking to me. I'm talking to myself because I'm in um, a different language. It just takes you. It, it takes you back to a certain realness where you can't avoid the truth. So I advise it to anybody: if you speak a different language and English is, isn't your first language, um, mm-hmm. and you're trying to problem solve, whether it be you know personal, whether it be mathematical, whatever it is, whatever the problem is, if you need to think about it, think about it in your native in your native tongue in your mind and the answers will come and the answers might not be the answers that you like but it'll be the truth because for some reason language brings out the truth is because it's, it's your true language yeah i like yeah, it we're, weird. we're not just doing comedy in this interview we're doing a bit of philosophy and life's lessons i, I like that yeah <laughs> we're, we're dropping bomb son no, i don't know, know what you guys call that in australia with that we're dropping, we're dropping, dropping that's knowledge. right That's it. Um, Actually, just one quick quip. I didn't use it before, and I might even cut it up, but you did say that Spanish is the weakest of your languages, but given how long your relationships lasted, it looks like you have mastered the loving tongue. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. (laughs) Anyway, you don't have to answer that. I told you all this information about me. Yeah, you're right. You're right. right. Uh, Now, you did mention your mum's ability to head to New York to give birth. Very clever. But am I right that you're the youngest of yes. your... Okay. Uh, because do you know yeah. you share something? Do the, these are all the youngest children. Are you ready? See if you yep. recognise any patterns. Eddie Murphy, okay. Charlie Chaplin, right. Billy Crystal, oh, wow. Steve Martin, Jim Carrey. Do you think there's something about being the <laughs> youngest child that I don't know whether it's survival or observation that sets you up for a life of quick thinking, sharp tongued comedy. Absolutely. I think being, being the youngest child, and it's also the more children that they have and the, the further off you're the youngest child, the, the, the more leeway you get. The first child mm. is the experimental child. The first child is like they're trying, to, they're trying to figure out what do we do with this little shit. We're trying to figure out what, 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 how it moves. And then they get this they practice run, and then they get the second child and, you know, the third child. So by the time, you know, like they got to me, like they were winded. My parents were. They, by the time I turned, like, because all my all, all the children in my family graduated with honors and scholars. Like my my older sister was a doctor, and she married to a doctor. My other sister was a preacher, and she's married to a preacher. I got a sister in the middle. She's a, she's, she's a teacher. My my older brother is like um, an engineer, and he runs the family business, and he just has all these brains, and like they're like they're like the superheroes. And then you got me, you know, like. <laughs> I want to talk about my penis to make money on stage. So that's what happened to me. Um, but we, we, I think I think they just they're just they're, 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 the parents get tired because like by the time I was like sixteen, I had more energy than they they, they had to run. A, you know, they're running businesses, they're doing all this and that. So of course, I was the first one to drop out of school. You know, not to graduate with you know honors or whatever you call it because they were, they ran out of energy. Yes. And when you're the youngest child, they, they love. I don't want to say they love you the most, but they they cherish you the most because to them, you'll always be a baby. Like you know, like the mm. oldest child is a baby when they're born. The only child, the first child, is a baby when they're born. But when they get older, they get older, and the next child is is the new baby, and the next child is the new baby. So the very last child is the actual baby. And no matter what happens in, in their parents' eyes, all the other children will be older. They're supposed to know better, but. The baby is always going to be a baby. You could be 80 years old. If you're the last child to your parents, you're always the baby, and you'll always reap the benefits of and, being a baby. And there is the sense of the last train moving out of the station too because I've got two girls who are 13 and 11, and I'm starting to lament the fact that I've only got a few years left of them at home under my roof, and so I suppose that plays into that dynamic as well. It's it, You're our last ticket to be a parent figure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway. It all it all rides on you. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, I've, I've got to get to some comedy proper, otherwise Maury will never book me again to do another podcast right. for him. Um, <laughs> right. The Comics Lounge, you're a regular there. Now, that yep. holds about 300, 400 people. 
How does it feel right. to perform at smaller shows? Meaning, uh, well, uh, it's a double edged. It's double edged question. Three hundred to four hundred is small compared to your past life, but also when you then venture out and you do a gig that might have forty people, how do you adjust? Uh, What's it like? Uh, when I when, when I first started, it was I felt like oh I, I, I don't want to do this because there's not enough people there. You know, like oh, forty people. Like it's forty people. It's like what is that? And then you know. That's the ego. You put your ego aside and you start, you, you, you know, a comedian's going to still go on stage because you want to perform. But I started realizing the more intimate the crowd, the less I had to prove myself oh. as far as like the joke. Because when you're in a big audience, you got to prove yourself. And by that, by that, I mean the way you throw your energy out. When you throw your energy, you got to connect with all those people. Now, if you go from 4,000 to forty. It's the jokes isn't in the actions. The jokes is in the words. You don't have to throw all your energy out. As a matter of fact, you, you, you can be too animated for them. And then it throws, it's almost like you're in a, a different setting. It goes from being in the theater to a living room. Mm. Are you going to do all the stuff you would do in the theater inside of a living room? Because you want to connect to the people. I did a show last night. Um, I was at a lounge last night, and the people there was, was smaller because of the, you know, co- the COVID restrictions. So... I just, I noticed that I started riffing, just going back and forth, and it was going going great. And then I started doing a joke that I always that always kills, and the joke didn't go that great. And it quickly reminded me, it's because I'm performing, like I'm, I'm performing to, you know, I'm performing the joke. I'm not being part of the discussion. So that's the difference you got to learn when you're performing. Um, yeah. I had to learn that. And I'm, and I'm glad I, I'm glad I did that because that makes you stronger. So whenever you're in front of uh, more people, people think that, it's more difficult performing in front of more people than there's less people. And that's not true. More people is easier because there's more relativity. You know, there's people are going to laugh because you're going to find more, more people to relate. The smaller the audience, the smaller the, um, the the perspectives can, you know, be relatable to. So you have to be very specific and you got to be very, you know, you have to connect to them individually. You can yeah. feel their presence. It's, it's one of those things where you have to, understand like you have to your potential is the potential of the room whether it's it could be three people you know and you have to understand that the 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 language of the laughs if so if i'm doing a show and there's three people in the audience and all three of them laugh and it might not sound like a loud laugh but that's the equivalent of getting an applause break in a bigger room because i managed to make three people who can hear each other laugh and they don't want to laugh in the first place because they don't want to be the only ones laugh so the more the more you have against you the better you become. It's like going to the gym, putting on more weights with less people. <laughs> right. I love that. I, that's really fascinating to think about that because I almost got the analogy that the big stage is like doing Broadway or doing theatre and the smaller audience is like TV because TV acting is when you're much closer to the camera and you've got to tone things down a bit, but you've got to be more authentic. The, the, the trick being... It's got to be real. Yes, mm. that's you hit it right on the head. Authenticity. You have to. That's why. That's, that's why I should have said. But you hit it right on the head. You're more authentic to a smaller audience. Yeah. Because they can see. They can, they can literally see you. See you like right through you. Okay. You know that the, the and and you're afraid to actually be your authentic self because you think it might not work. But it does. Mm-hmm. Comedians were always afraid that they're not going to get it, but they do. So it, what happens is you you writing a joke down. You go, no, they're not going to get it. It's it's too it's too something that only I understand, and they don't do it. In retrospect, that's exactly what you're supposed to do. They're going to get it, and and they'll appreciate it because you said it the way you were going to say. It, yeah. You know, um, that's authenticity. Is like um, the, the audience is like uh, lions. They can stick a sense fear, and the way you feel. Is the way they're going to feel. And if you, like, say something that's pretty crazy, but you own it, they're going to respect you for that. They might not laugh as much, but they're going to respect you. Now, if you say something that, you know, that's pretty crazy and you don't own it, then they're going to eat you alive like a lion would do, you know? What would being all sort of um, animalistic and, and tribal and natural and reflecting on things, I want to just go one level deeper because okay. you've said before in the past that in the U.S. it's the headliners that are arrogant and the open micers that are humble. But when we think about things here in Australia, the headliners, people like Hughesy, they're pretty down to earth. 
And there are a number of open micers who just have a an air of entitlement about them. Yes. What, what's yes. going? What do you think's going on? Because I think this links into I, authenticity and all sorts of things. I don't, man. Man, I've, you know what, man? Next month will be my 25, 25th year in this business. Twenty five years of doing stand up, and let me tell you something. I've never seen anything like it. I think it's just <laughs> it goes. <laughs> It goes with this, this, you know, like I, I and I feel like an old person saying this, you know, like <laughs> like outside of comedy, people go, oh, these these young people there, they feel so entitled, this and that, and I'm like, oh, leave them alone. And then I, I see myself in comedy, like, oh, these fucking open micers, they're they're so this and this, they're so that. Like, what is wrong with these guys? Like, I don't, it's, <laughs> I don't know where this comes from, and I've seen it. I've I've seen comics who like I have a room that I run myself, right? Yeah. And um um I see comics who like ask for a spot, and they're very humble, right? And then like they'll get a little bit of heat, and like they won't even say hi to you when they see you. Like oh, <laughs> it's like God. where do they learn that? Who okay? And I, I have to laugh at it because I know they're about to they're about to fall, and I'm I'm like because. I've been there. I've been arrogant. I've I've gone through the arrogant phase, but like nothing like this. There's a group of them, and they're just so like <laughs> they're not their original G's. Like you know, you see guys like Hughesy. You know, Hughesy takes his time. He says hi to everybody. There's not an ounce of of, of cockiness in in him. He does like open mics anywhere because he loves the art. Now you see these guys who like uh, <laughs> nowadays they, they don't want to perform unless you know they're getting paid because somebody gave them ten bucks two days ago for a show, <laughs> and now they feel like they're a professional comedian. And they don't, they don't, <laughs> and they're the type of comedians who like you ask them how long have you been doing comedy, and they go, "I've been doing that for about uh, maybe nine months." Uh, how much material you got? Oh, I got like four hours. I'm like, <laughs> You got four hours and nine months. I know exactly where your career is going to the trash because you have no idea what it, what it takes. Like you don't understand. Like <laughs> they'll do a joke that gets like a chuckle, right? And they go, "Oh, that's it." Next joke. I'm like, "No, that chuckle needs to go into an applause break." You don't stop working on that joke or that bit or that chunk until it gets an applause break. If that's getting an applause break, why would you move on? You're gonna be stuck with a bunch of fillers. You're not gonna have anything that's 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 re- resonate with the audience. The way I do my shows, the way I, I deal with the way I would like to do my shows is every joke that I finish has an applause break. But these, these new cats, they, I don't know where they get this arrogance from. If I did know, then I'd be part of the problem. So I'm kind of happy I don't know. Like, I don't want to know what <laughs> gives them this entitlement to think that uh, they're just better than what they are. Hey, look, that, that's fine, actually, but I'm going to correct you. It's not to the trash. It's to the rubbish. Thank you. Rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Rubbish. Is trash an offensive word here? Oh, look, we all we all get it because we all grew up on Sesame Street, so <laughs> we got indoctrinated by U.S. culture. Um, one last question, otherwise uh, Maury's going to give me the big wind up, uh, and it's just a, a little bit another comparison here to U.S. because. When we can fly again, there are going to be some people who want to go over there and and do some performances. Um, is it is it right that? Stand up over there. The support acts do about half an hour. The headliners do a minimum of an hour. Here it tends to yeah. be 15 minutes for the support and maybe 45 minutes for the for the headliner. Uh, is that right? And can, have you got a sense of why there is that difference from what you've seen? You, know, you, got, you got some really, really nice questions, man. Um, I actually like that. It, it works for me, you know, mm. I, because... Um, and in in when I was in America, I was when I was opening for Pablo, I was only doing um, 25 to 30 minutes. I needed to have like an hour, and sometimes an hour and 15 to an hour and a half to the headline, right? And then like when I left the tour and I came over here, I was like, oh, I got to get a whole new hour of material that, that's universal so Australians can understand. Then I found out you, know, you don't need like about 30 to 40 minutes to headline here. So <laughs> I immediately jumped into the headline spot. I'm like, oh, I can headline. I got enough time. So it, it works out. Now, is it fair? And that that's to, to the observer. That's that's you know, that's the beholder. However, in America, the M C is um low on a totem pole. He's the lowest person on the lowest oh. individual on the on on the bill. Like the M C is a guy who's trying. Like he's sacrificial meat wow. and he's like he or she, or whatever uh, they want to classify themselves as, non-binary, whatever, that entity is the lowest talent on the bill. And uh, they're not, and they're paid the lowest, and they're the one, sometimes, you know, just them performing it is the payment. They don't even get paid at all. That's how we started. 
Um, over here, it's different where the, the MC and the headliner is actually part of the show, uh, part, are like the ones who are yes. running the gig. That, that, that threw me off a bit. One what threw me off as well was you guys have brackets here. That threw me off, really threw me off. It took me a while to get used to that. I didn't, in America, we do our shows. We'd, when, I, when we do the improv, we do one show Monday, I'm sorry, one show Wednesday, one show Thursday, two Friday, and three Saturdays. And we, we wouldn't have um, any breaks. If you're going to order food, if you're going to order drinks, um, it would come during the show. We have what they call controlled chaos, and it, it, it all worked out. If we had a break, <laughs> no bill is going to get paid. You know how many runners we'd have? Because like you, get, you pay your bill at the end of the night, and you know that's how we get paid. So over here, when you have brackets, I remember the first time I came here, I was performing at the lounge, uh, and you know, I was getting ready. You know, I was headlining, as a matter of fact. And then the, the MC goes, "All right, guys, we're gonna go to a break." I'm like, "What is this? What's going on here?" And I ran to the. <laughs> I'm like, "Hey, are they going to come back?" He's yeah. Like, yeah. I'm like, "Are they gonna pay their bill?" He goes, "What do you mean?" He's like, "They they, they paid." Their, it just took me a while to wrap my head around that that they need a break. You know, like now I'm used to it. But when, even to this very day, when I talk to my American friend. Even those who are like mad professional and very, you know, you know, on their game. When I tell them about a break, they lose their minds. Like, there's a break because like the momentum is lost. Yeah, you know, that's, that's why the MC probably gets paid more. All right. So August fourteenth, I believe you're going to be performing at the Rubber Chicken at South Melbourne. And I want to, yeah. I want to ask what sort of show audiences can expect. And also, from what you've just said, don't drink beforehand because there won't be any toilet breaks. You're going to be locked in the room for about three hours. That's what I'm... No? Oh. <laughs> no, I don't know. I, don't, I, I mean, is, is that the format of the rubber chicken? I think... I, I, no, it'll be the I mean, Aussie format. There'll be breaks. Yeah. <laughs> no, they, they're, it's, it's, I'm actually uh, pretty excited to do uh, the rubber chicken. I've actually I've heard you know great things about it, and I wanted to experience um, a new room. Uh, even though I'm a regular at the lounge, but it's also nice to to uh, you know be able to gain your build, build your profile up. Yep. And they've done a fantastic job with what they're doing. So um, the show is just basically just a show about me and the transition from moving to um, America. Uh, my take on it um, as an African American comedian uh, living in Australia and how I perceive things and how. And I kind of put the mirror up to Australia, respectfully, of course, because I'm not not trying to get booed. But I, I, I showed the mirror to them, saying, "You know, you guys do these things, and you, do, you and you do these things nonchalantly, I mean, not realizing the significance or insignificance, given the." Uh, the context of the joke that I'm doing. And that's what, that's what it's about mainly. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I wish I was over there. I, I, gonna, I Mind you, I have performed at the Rubber Chicken myself, so I can give you some tips. Uh, you know, I've got yeah. about four and a half hours of material, actually, so, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> uh, no, uh, I wish you all the best. August 14, um, if you can get there, please do, because it sounds like it's going to be wonderful. Lots of storytelling and great connection with the audience. Um, last question, do you do private yeah. shows uh, for clubs, etc.? And by this, I'm not referring to you noting that you keep a platonic relationship with all of them. So when I say private shows, uh, <laughs> I'm talking comedy. Uh, yes. Uh, do you hire yourself out for that? Yeah, I do. And I how can people that, contact uh, They can contact me. Uh, they can get me at, at the, it's Instagram. I'm at ashthecomic1. That's at that little symbol, whatever. A S H T H E C O M I C, the comic one, or comedian Ashley Fizeme on uh, my Facebook fan page. They can contact me through there. I don't know if I'm. It would be wise to give my phone, my personal phone number out. But uh, yeah, well, that would be the best ways to, to communicate with me. That's right. I, I will make sure we put your personal phone number on the show notes for this podcast. And address. Don't forget my, my personal home address, too, and my, and my social security and my bank account details and PIN. And most importantly, the feed from the live camera yeah. in your bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> in my bedroom, yes. <laughs> uh, Ashley Fiesme, thank you so much for joining the School of Hard Knock Docs podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I hope our Absolutely. paths cross again and we get to see you before. Absolutely. Thank you so much.
Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details.